Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe it was Socrates who said, and I quote, the highest realms of thought are impossible to reach without first attaining an understanding of compassion, unquote. Mr. Speaker, you need no convincing whatsoever that this 2023-2024 appropriation bill is pregnant with compassion. And of course that the member for Labri Oje gives unbridled support to the appropriation bill. Mr. Speaker, after the Prime Minister delivered his address on Tuesday evening, in certain parts of this country, from one end of this country to the next, there was celebration. So the J really and truly is jubilation. Because this appropriation bill is also jam-packed with goodies for the people of this country. Another J, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party and Prime Minister came from a party of bread, justice, and freedom. And the J for justice has been introduced in the pages of the appropriation bill. Mr. Speaker, this appropriation bill has all the elements of an excellent budget. Because as the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance's budgetary policy statement enunciates a comprehensive set of policies, programs, and plans to overcome the financial, economic, social, and environmental challenges required to develop a dynamic, innovative, inclusive, competitive, and sustainable economy to meet the needs of the current and future generations of St. Lucians. And this budget obviously can be described as one pregnant with policies that gel together. Another J, Mr. Speaker. You have a man who's judicious in dealing with the business of this country, Mr. Speaker. Another J. And of course, the last one yesterday that my colleagues talked about was jobs. Another J. Now, when a man has presented such a budget, what do you expect from the opposition? They must be jealous. They are jittery. They are jumpy. They are jaded. Mr. Speaker, obviously, do not expect them to greet this appropriation bill with music and flowers. Their value system, very different to ours. We have always been a government of compassion. A party which believes in giving bread, justice, and freedom to the people of this country, irrespective of their political allegiance. Because the Prime Minister knows that he needs to put this economy back on track. Because what we can deliver will always be a function of the economic and financial health of the country. It's just like a home. <laughs> a father is employed, getting $5,000 a month, taking care of his kids, he can do so much. If he loses his job, Mr. Speaker, and then the children cannot understand that and they continue to demand what he cannot afford, that's something else. Because the people of this country were coming from a period of COVID where in excess of $300 million being given for income support and they were gasping for air and they were sucking salt during that particular period. Whilst the FFF empire 
got fat, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia economy has over the past 20 years registered long-run average growth of below 2% and has been plagued by a number of interrelated and interlocking factors, including persistent fiscal deficit and high debt, stubborn and persistent structural rigidities in the economy, Mr. Speaker. Major contributors to this development has been the diminishing importance of the banana industry, weak competitiveness, low productivity, and an over-dependence on the tourism sector. These interrelated factors, Mr. Speaker, have been significantly exacerbated by external shocks, including frequent and major fluctuations in energy prices, other external shocks, including financial crises, and more recently, the COVID pandemic and the Russian-Ukraine war, not to mention the planet's greatest existential threat, climate change. The challenges facing the St. Lucia economy, Mr. Speaker, while by no means insurmountable, are quite complex. Hence, these challenges, Mr. Speaker, require careful diagnosis and the crafting of evidence-based policies grounded in solid analytical and research work. The policies contained in this budget, Mr. Speaker, have been carefully calibrated, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to address these ongoing challenges, and we are already seeing the benefits from the successful delivery of some of our policies. We unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, have had to manage an economy that was broken, broke, mismanaged, and misdirected an unfortunate legacy bequeathed to us by the former administration led by the leader of the opposition masquerading as Faye J. We Toot in this honorable house and the country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, we, conti we continue to hear the opposition peddling on troops indicating that they left behind a song platform for our government Nothing, Mr. Speaker, is further from the truth, Deputy Speaker, as I will now clearly demonstrate. The practice that trickle down economics, which all over the world has been a palpable failure, Mr. Speaker. How can an approach that plunged the economy of this country before COVID in 2019 in a precipice, how could such body of policies provide any type of explanation for the magic in the economy today? How can you use that to predict with certainty that the economy would grow, Mr. Speaker? The last report card of the former administration was issued by the International Monetary Fund through its 2022 Article 4 consultation. I think we can all agree Mr. Speaker, that the IMF, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the IMF is an independent arbiter for the benefit of honorable members, Mr. Speaker, the 2022 IMF Article 4 report can be accessed on the website. In this regard, I now turn to the subject of economic policy, and I wish to first deal with economic growth, Mr. Speaker. This is what the IMF had to say about the projected growth of St. Lucia, and I quote, output is projected to gradually recover to the pre-pandemic levels by 2024 slowed by the impacts of the war in Ukraine and the tightening of global financial conditions." Unquote. The reference for this is page 8 of the IMF report, Mr. Speaker. I recall, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition being very boastful about St. Lucia's economic growth performance of 12.2% in 2021, suggesting as if this was some kind of economic miracle. Mr. Speaker, he portrayed himself as a wizard waving a magic wand to cause this growth performance. What the leader of the opposition failed to say was that the context in which the growth of 12.2% was realized was a massive contraction of 24.4% in 2020, which of course that level of contraction was largely his doing. Our report card to date, Mr. Speaker, is contained in the 2022 Economic and Social Review. 
St. Lucia's growth performance was by far the best in the OECS and second only to Guyana in CARICOM. And we all know, Mr. Speaker, we all know it's because Guyana discovered oil. Now, if we still had our coconut oil, we're growing even better, you know, Mr. Speaker. But that's for another show. <laughs> so as I indicated, only Guyana in CARICOM, Mr. Speaker. And you heard right, we grew by 18.1%. This growth performance exceeded the 12.2% in 2021 and was far higher than the ECCU average of 8.9%. The growth rates of other countries in the ECCU are as follows. Antigua and Barbuda, 8.5%. Dominica, 5.9%. Grenada, 5.9%. St. Kitts, Nevis, 7.7%. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 5%. We were the only country in the ECCU to record double digit growth, Mr. Speaker. The chorus of propaganda being disseminated by the opposition has now been totally and utterly refuted and discredited by the data presented by the Statistics Department. The reference for this data, Mr. Speaker, is page 10 of the Economic and Social Review. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, this impressive growth rate was achieved despite recording a contraction of 12.6% in, in the construction sector and was broad-based led by tourism with growth of 58.5%, 9.8% in agriculture, 11.4% in manufacturing, 19.3% in transport and storage, and 33.7% in communication and information services. The reference for this growth rates, Mr. Speaker, is page 91 of the Economic and Social Review. Mr. Speaker, this performance is even more impressive because the IMF predicted that we would recover to pre-COVID levels of GDP by 2024. We have, for all practical purposes, attained pre-COVID levels in 2022. In fact, we are only below the pre-COVID level by 1.1%. This government continues to defy expectations, Mr. Speaker, and to beat all forecasts that were originally predicted by the IMF. Barring any major external shocks, natural disasters, and black swan events, we are poised to surpass in the level of real GDP of 2019 in 2023. Mr. Speaker, the member for Schwazel Saltibus, where has he dis disappeared to, should take note that the Honorable Philip J. Pierre, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, passed a budget for fiscal year 2022-2023, which coincided with the laudable performance of the economy during that period. Mr. Speaker, the member for Schwazel Saltibus should be reminded that we continued the implementation of the budget for fiscal year 2021-2022, which ended on March 31st, 2022. It is therefore bad news, Mr. Speaker, for the member for Schwozel Saldibas to give credit to the former administration for the economic performance in 2022. One of the major challenges faced by the government is the extremely weak fiscal position inherited by the former government. The IMF report states on page 6, and I quote, the public balance sheet remains under significant strain. Slow revenue recovery and pandemic-related spending, including fr front-loading capital projects to support the economy, led to a budget deficit of 6.5% of GDP in financial year 2021. Despite strong external support from international development partners and limited redemptions from regional security-based financing, the government's high financing needs over 2020-2021 resulted in significant cash constraints and buildup of overdrafts and arrears of about 4.3% of GDP in financial year 2021. 
public debt rose significantly from just above 60 in financial year 2019 to 96.9% .9 of GDP in financial year 2020 and then remain elevated at 92.2% of GDP in the fiscal year 2021, unquote. Mr. Speaker, this is what the IMF had to say about the leader of the opposition's fiscal policies. His policies, Mr. Speaker, led to the largest buildup of public debt in the OECS, rocketing from 60% in fiscal year 2019 to 96.9% .9 in fiscal year 2020 and remain elevated in the fiscal year 2021. This is despite, Mr. Speaker, receiving substantial external support from the international development partners. In his quest to win the general election, the former UWP administration sought to front load capital projects, many of which were being conceptualized during the process of project execution, illustrating not only the worst practice in, in project management, but poor governance, as these projects were hurriedly approved by direct award by the leader of the opposition. These projects included the notorious Rodney Bay Four Lane project, for which the member for Caswis North has disclosed in this honorable house, and no designs. No designs, Mr. Speaker, and no designs. Nor were there any studies done beforehand to show how this supposedly four-lane highway would contribute to relieving traffic congestion. These types of scandalous, wasteful projects are a major drain on the public purse. This highway, I believe, may have cost around $20 million, Mr. Spe Mr. Deputy Speaker. Money which could have been put to far greater use for the benefit of the citizens of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the former administration engaged in a litany of such wasteful, massively overpriced and inefficient projects, the majority of which were granted by direct awards. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker or Speaker, the same thing. <laughs> led by the extremely competent and principled member for caste resist, has managed the, the scarce resources of the state in a manner that ensures economy, efficiency, and effectiveness so that the people of St. Lucia will benefit. And this is what compassion is all about. When you use compassion as a ready compass in which to set your course, you are going to deliver bread, justice, and freedom to the people of this country. And God Almighty will give you the courage, wisdom, foresight, and vision to do what you must do. Not only to take our country to a new level of development, but also moving into the next general elections with unanimous acclamation, return the member for Cassius East to the levers of power. We will not engage in wasteful projects like DSH and the associated unnecessary construction of a new road, closing down Boseju Agricultural Station, as well as the Viewfront Landfill, Lockerbie's playing fields, and we'll certainly not engage in throwing away money to buy vaccines from a company that is not involved in pharmaceuticals. Our policies, Mr. Speaker, are to ensure economy, efficiency, and effectiveness of government expenditures to ensure that these expenditures have the largest impact on growth and development, and more importantly, benefit the people of St. Lucia. More broadly, Mr. Speaker, the former government engaged in reckless fiscal policy, increasing overdrafts and payables to unsustainable levels, Mr. Speaker, the IMF pronounced a bleak, stark, and gloomy outlook had we continue with the failed policies of the former UWP government. This is what the IMF said, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, the fiscal outlook presents significant challenges due to high public debt and large refinancing needs. Assuming no policy changes, Public debt is projected to stabilize at a high level, near 90% of GDP in the medium term. Unquote. The reference 
for this is page 8 of the IMF Article 4 report, Mr. Speaker. The UWP government's legacy, Mr. Speaker, was to leave us with the current policies, resulting in public debt stabilizing at 90% of GDP in the medium term. When I read this, Mr. Speaker or Deputy Speaker, I was flabbergasted. As a public debt to GDP of 90% in the medium term was clearly put in St. Lucia on a steep fiscal cliff which would seriously jeopardize our prospects for economic growth and development. At this juncture, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I need to respond to an ill-conceived and illogical statement made by the member for Schwozel Saltibas. I'm happy that he's back. He stated that we argued that the loans that were contracted during the COVID pandemic were irresponsible loans. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for Schwozel Saltibas needs to be enlightened. What we questioned was not the irresponsibility of the loans, but the utilization of those loans which were disbursed to benefit a select few in the country. We question the utilization of these loan funds which were being disbursed to the FFF with little benefit to the people who at the time were suffering and not benefiting from these funds which were intended to provide relief to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, we have again defied the IMF's forecast which I must repeat, were based on the former administration's policies. The record on the public debt showed that our government, led by the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, a competent and astute economist, has taken the public debt to GDP down the steep fiscal cliff of 85.9% in 2021 to a plateau of 69.8% in 2022. This performance is outstanding, Mr. Speaker. By any measure, our public debt to GDP ratio has fallen by a record 16.1%. This again represents the steepest decline in the ECCU countries and compares favorably with the ECCU average of 75.5% of GDP. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, our debt service to current revenue, which shows how much of our revenue is used to pay our debt, fell from 29.3% to 24.5%. This performance is even more impressive, Mr. Speaker, when one considers that we were confronted with strong headwinds from the external environment, including higher oil prices, higher inflation, and higher interest rates. So it was not just COVID, Mr. Speaker. It was higher oil prices, higher inflation, and higher interest rates. So Mr. Speaker, we have a leader with a clear and practical understanding of economics and finance. This goes to show, Mr. Speaker, that we have a Minister of Finance who is a competent, responsible, and astute policy practitioner who understands how to carefully balance the goals of fiscal discipline with sustainable, inclusive, and efficient growth. Our fiscal policies, Mr. Speaker, have been geared to providing relief to the lower income groups who have been most disadvantaged by the current external economic environment. The restructuring of the income tax regime, which takes effect this year, will result in an additional 15,000 people paying no income taxes and will help support these individuals in coping with the increase in the cost of living. Pregnant with compassion, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will not engage in irresponsible fiscal policy that are disjointed, ad, ad hoc, and irresponsible, like the reduction of the value-added tax from 15% to 12.5%, resulting in massive hemorrhaging of our revenues, estimated at $60 million per annum, with little or no benefit to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, when the member for VFO South introduced VAT, a number of items were zero rated or exempted. So whether you take VAT from 20% to 0%, they're already at zero, Mr. Speaker. 
And so it was just trying to be fog the sound common sense of the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, the fiscal policies practiced by our government will continue to be responsible, disciplined, and geared to recreating fiscal space, which sadly became a black hole with the policies of the last administration. Mr. Speaker, so that we can provide more resources for critical public services, including national security, health, and education. We will not, however, rest, Mr. Speaker, as there is much work to be done, as we need to forge ahead to fully restructure the economy of St. Lucia, improving productivity, competitiveness, and dynamism, and providing the necessary social and human resources to improve the lives of the people of this country. So, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that when we got into office last year, we had, the year before last, we had a mess in the economy. The member for Cassius East did not practice austerity because we found people suffering in this country. He delivered the largest budget in the history of this country and yet still was able to balance the clutch and the gas, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have this impressive performance whilst delivering to the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, we have started the journey of addressing the major fundamental challenges affecting St. Lucia. We will not pay lip service like the former administration who wanted to build a new St. Lucia, a new St. Lucia by forgetting the old St. Lucia and implementing what I have called fast food policies that were grounded in political expediency, poor governance, and unnecessary extravagance. The Prime Minister and Minister for Finance has articulated his investment priorities in this year's budget estimates. And in his budgetary policy statement, I am sure all of us in this Honorable House will be happy to hear that the St. Jude project has recommenced. Our government, after reviewing all of the options based on technical and financial considerations, took a reasoned decision to complete the original St. Jude project. Mr. Speaker, we did not do like the former government, which commissioned a $1 million technical audit and then decided to ignore the recommendations and commence the construction of a new building without any basis and which to date has cost the taxpayer in excess of $118 million and requires almost as much as that amount to complete it. This, Mr. Speaker, is a total waste of resources, money which could have been used elsewhere to develop the country. Mr. Speaker, our government has also reviewed the options for the airport project in terms of size, scope, and cost, and will take cost control measures to reduce the significant cost overruns that have already been incurred on this project. These two major projects, when completed, Mr. Speaker, will contribute significantly to the development of the south of the island. We need to be reminded, Mr. Speaker, that both projects would have been completed had we remained in office in 2016 to 2021. However, the former administration decided, based on fallacious reasoning, to pursue different approaches, costing the taxpayers millions of dollars in excess of the original project cost. Our government will continue to pursue a well-developed public sector investment program that is consistent with our development goals as expressed in our manifesto and to continue to ensure that the citizens of this country get the best value for money. Our government understands the need to develop a vibrant private sector and we will put in place the enabling environment to stimulate both foreign and local private investment in this country. We will, to the extent possible, remove the impediments constraining private sector investment. We will also honor agreements made with prospective investors, unlike again the former administration, which reneged on the agreement with Range and was forced to pay millions of valuable taxpayers' dollars as compensation to Range. It is well known, Mr. Speaker, 
that the major source of growth and dynamism in the private sector is the micro, small, and medium enterprises sector, or the MSME sector, as it is known. The sector has tremendous potential for creating jobs and opportunities for existing and new businesses. We are going to continue to carry out a sustained assault on unemployment by having the people of this country to be active participants in the development of the country. Our government will continue to provide support for this sector, and in this regard, the government recently implemented a new MSME facility, which will be managed by the Ministry of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs, and the St. Lucia Development Bank will be the disbursement agency. This is an EC $10 million loan facility aimed at providing post-COVID pandemic relief to registered MSMEs. It is a 70% grant and 30% loan funding with a concessionary interest rate of 3% per annum. It is the intention of our government to continue to provide support to this very important sector. As you know, Mr. Speaker, the results from that will not be a product of spontaneous combustion. It will take time. It has a certain gestation period before it gives birth to result. But I know at some point in the future, I know that over the next eight years, as Prime Minister of this country, the member for Cassius East will take us to the promised land, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we need to address as a matter of priority, the long-term structural rigidities in the economy to improve financial, economic, and physical resilience and thereby improve the long-term productivity of the, of the economy. The available research indicates that there are skills mismatches in the labor market and points to the need to invest more resources in relevant education that is aligned with the economic priorities of the government. Since assuming office, Mr. Speaker, the unemployment rate has continued to fall. Based on the labor market data from the statistics department, and this can be accessed, Mr. Speaker, at the following website, and it was on the screen on the official labor department website, and you will get historical data. The unemployment rate reached a high of 24% in the second quarter of 2020 and then averaged just over 23% in the first three quarters of 2021. In the last quarter of 2021, the unemployment rate dropped to 19.6% and continued to drop in 2022 falling to 16% in the first quarter of 2022. This is the lowest unemployment rate recorded over the last 10 years and then increasing to 17.5% in the second quarter of 2022. Overall, Mr. Speaker, the average annual unemployment rate fell from 21.9% in 2021 to 16.5% in 2022 representing a reduction of 5.4 percentage points. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, the number of employed individuals is estimated to have peaked in the last quarter of 2022 at 91,270. Encouragingly, youth unemployment has fallen from 37% in 2021 to 26.9% in 2022. The available data presented in the Economic and Social Review on page 10 shows that this was the lowest youth unemployment rate over the period 2010-2023. These are no insignificant set of data. This favorable number suggests that our policies are already working and the declining unemployment rate are definitely in keeping with other studies in this country. For example, a report by the Chamber of Commerce. Notwithstanding this impressive performance, Mr. Speaker, our party continues to implement appropriate measures to reduce unemployment to reach a longer term target of below 10%. Our policies to achieve this challenging target 
requires a number of focused policy interventions which our government has already started, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, irrespective of which party one support, you must salute the Minister for Finance and Prime Minister for a job well done. And when we reach out and we look at education, we need to target the education sector and increase the transition rate from secondary to tertiary education, working towards our long-term goal of having a university graduate in every family in St. Lucia. What will happen, Mr. Speaker, as we place more emphasis on education, where more of the secondary school graduates go to tertiary institution, it will reduce the rate at which they are going to enter the labor market. And they will not be counted among the unemployed. So therefore, when you look at the overall handling of unemployment, and of course, economic growth, we will create a much improved framework, Mr. Speaker. It is important to note, Mr. Speaker, that a review of the labor market data would reveal that many of the unemployed are people with little or no educational qualifications. The majority of the people with university education are by and large employed and are generally in higher paying jobs. The overall impact of increasing the number of university graduates will result in lower unemployment and provide higher paid job employment opportunities resulting in not only higher levels of economic growth but a higher level of GDP per capita. My ministry will continue to pursue diplomatic avenues to seek scholarship opportunities for students in St. Lucia to facilitate the improvement in human capital in the country and thereby continue contribute to higher levels of economic growth. Our overseas foreign service offices will aggressively pursue scholarship opportunities on behalf of our students, as we are aware that there are many students who do not have the financial capability to pursue university studies. Mr. Speaker, another important plank of our government's economic strategy is the implementation of the youth economy that most of my colleagues accentuated. The youth economy was recently launched, and from all indications, it is an initiative that has received tremendous support from the youth. Young people in my constituency are saying to me, this is the first time in the history of this country that the government has considered them to be equal and valuable partners. Come to the table and sit beside others and take your place because we need to continue the journey to the promised land. As indicated earlier, Mr. Speaker, youth unemployment, although on a declining trend since our government assumed office is still way too high, and it is the intention of our government through the youth economy to provide business opportunities for the young people of St. Lucia. Our government will also continue, as the member for Castries not accentuated, to pursue the development of the renewable energy sector. We need to, as a matter of urgency, pursue the transition to renewable energy so as to reduce our vulnerabilities to the volatility in oil prices and to also reduce the cost of electricity, major cost for both businesses and households. The final plank of our economic strategy, I would like to touch on, Mr. Speaker, is the need for our economy to become more diversified. St. Lucia currently ranks among the least diversified countries in the region, and our government has recognized the need for developing sectors with, in particular, potential for export growth, including agro-processing and the creatives. I would also like to mention Export St. Lucia, which is, play, which is playing a vital role in our export diversification strategy through helping businesses to market their products and undertaking market intelligence. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, 
that the Prime Minister for Finance, the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, has developed a comprehensive suite of policies, projects, and programs for the holistic development of St. Lucia. It is clear, Mr. Speaker, that the dashboard of indicators are all moving in the right direction. And our government is bringing back trust, hope, and confidence to the governance of this country. The country is being led and managed by an extremely astute and competent economist. And our government will continue to provide effective stewardship of the government's resources and to pursue the right economic, social, and environmental policies and programs to develop an inclusive, sustainable, and dynamic St. Lucia. Hence, Mr. Speaker, at this juncture, it is quite fitting to speak to the role of my ministry in creating an improved framework for us to match our basic need with greater possibilities. I speak of the Ministry of External Affairs, International Trade, Civil Aviation and Diaspora Affairs, the ministry that I have been assigned by the Prime Minister. When you look at the contemporary global political environment, Mr. Speaker, I have often said in this House, it is pregnant with the seeds of our country's continued marginalization. But Mr. Speaker, despite the difficulties of the moment, to advance the work of the ministry and government and people of St. Lucia, residents in the Ministry of External Affairs, International Trade, Civil Aviation and Diaspora Affairs is a cadre of well-qualified and highly motivated public officers in all the departments. They always work assiduously towards fulfilling the mandate of the ministry. And at this juncture, Mr. Speaker, I wish to salute my staff for working most times on the very trying circumstances, which include surveying multiple spheres simultaneously with limited resources. Mr. Speaker, contrary to the propaganda of many, that the Ministry of External Affairs is a cost center and government spends more on us than major ministries. Beneath the rubble of this propaganda is the truth that our ministry operates on a very small budget. Mr. Speaker, by way of example, in this year's estimates of revenue and expenditure, on page Roman numeral six, summary of total expenditure, the Ministry of Education, for example, which is the big ministry that they say we get more money than, has 200, a total of 242 million 677,700. The Ministry of Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs, 186 million 448,500. Our ministry has a total budget, Mr. Speaker, I'm even afraid to say what it is, of 29,812,300. My ministry's allocation goes in the Ministry of Education budget almost eight times, and that of the Ministry of Health 6.3 times. Now, a portion of that $29 million, over a million is to renovate a government asset in Washington. And of course, a very big chunk in excess of five million is to pay for regional and international organizations that we belong to. And the cacadon that's left, Mr. Speaker, that you need a microscope to see it, is what is being utilized to take care of my ministry and the missions, Mr. Speaker. So I, I want to get that clear. But whilst we are not getting a tremendous amount of resources, we are helping the country in realizing some fundamental objectives. And in the tireless dispatch of its mandate, the Ministry of External Affairs, Civil Aviation and Diaspora Affairs continues to facilitate and advance development cooperation at both the multilateral and bilateral levels. In this regard, the ministry's efforts have been tremendous. Indeed, over the year in review, and I just want to give you an Adam break, we have facilitated an advance and increase, an increasing quantum of development cooperation with more friendly governments. Now, I'm just giving a sample, because you don't have to draw all the blood from the human body to actually test for hemoglobin. Take a little sample. So I'm just going to give you all trailers, Mr. Speaker. And I'm going to start with Mexico. 
That cooperation has resulted in the implementation of four significant projects. The Heritage Management Project to promote national identity, create new tourism experiences, and reduce unemployment through training, policy formulation, institutional design, and the development of a registry of national heritage assets. Two, a project to conduct biocultural investigations of the Dauphin Valley. Three, a project to strengthen St. Lucia's capacity to design and update coastal geographic information for better environmental planning. To date, practitioners from a wide range of local sectors have been trained and exposed to advanced mapping techniques. You will not hear those things, Mr. Speaker. Four, a project to enhance the availability of water in quantity and quality in one of St. Lucia's major watersheds with skills acquired under the training component of this project already being implemented by the Water Resource Management Agency. I go to Japan. Over the past fiscal year, my ministry also facilitated development cooperation with Japan, resulting in the signing of a grant agreement valued at over 25 million for improvement works to the Schwazel Fisheries Port, and facilitated the fulfillment of protocols and legal requirements for securing an extension to the 37 million Eastern Caribbean dollars grant from the government of Japan to undertake the construction of the recently handed over cul-de-sac bridge, which have strengthened a crucial piece of infrastructure that is expected to contribute positively to national economic activity and save properties adjacent to it from the destructive forces of adverse weather phenomena. I go to Taiwan, Mr. Speaker. Further 2022-2023 saw the deepening and broadening of cooperation with the Republic of China, Taiwan, a staunch and unfailing ally in St. Lucia's development quest, resulting in the implementation of several projects in diverse development areas, project grant funding of over 50 million, and the signing of the framework agreement on technical cooperation between the government of St. Lucia and the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan. Mr. Speaker, I have remained quiet during our many sessions in this house, but the Prime Minister recently in accepting support from the Taiwanese administration did indicate publicly that I was dispatched as Minister for External Affairs in some delicate negotiations to assist the country, to assist the fiscal framework of this country. And quite a significant number was realized in this regard that will impact every constituency positively in this country, the work of the Ministry of External Affairs. We are generally in the engine room. My staff are not among those they call cocktail ambassadors. We are not those who are masquerading all over the place. We work hard, Mr. Speaker. My protocol officers, sometimes only two of them, with vehicles breaking down sometimes to ensure that we take dignitaries and orders from the airport to the hotels and back to the airport. And during this fiscal year, Mr. Speaker, we need some vehicles. And, and I know that the Minister for Finance will understand now we, we need free. In the area of health, the Ministry of External Affairs presided over bilateral cooperation with Brazil and Argentina that realized the supply of large quantities of vaccine along with other medical supplies to fight various critical diseases that threaten the lives of our people, including a donation of 12,000 doses of COVID-19 vaccine, donation of 10,000 doses of tetanus vaccine, donation of 6,000 doses of polio vaccine, donation of large quantity of drugs for the treatment of viral hepatitis. Just to mention a few. Canada, bilateral cooperation between St. Lucia and Canada has continued with assistance in institutional capacity. Member for Labrie, you have 10 minutes left. Member for Castries Central. 
Mr. Speaker, I wish to invoke standing order 3210 to permit the member for Labry an additional 40 minutes to conclude his presentation. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the member for Labry an additional 40, 40 minutes in which to complete his presentation. And I'll put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. aye, as many as of a country opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Please proceed, member. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, my colleagues. Similar to the last debate, I will not abuse your patience. The 40 minutes is more than sufficient. I will maneuver within such parameters and probably land way before that time. So, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying with Canada, our bilateral cooperation between St. Lucia and Canada has continued with assistance in institutional capacity, citizen security, public sector productivity and trade among the initiatives implemented work, completion of a five-year strategic plan to strengthen the free zone management authorities regulatory framework in order to facilitate significant and sustainable local private sector, regional and international participation in goods distribution free zone. Preparation of a maritime tourism strategy for St. Lucia with a focus on the cruising, yachting, ferry and pleasure boating subsectors and related inland services. Three, completion of a human resources audit of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College and the formulation of recommendations to align the staff and structure of that institution in readiness for university status. So, Mr. Speaker, a number of persons would look at the Ministry of External Affairs, and because we, di we, we do not disembark on our American Airlines with a fine gene on our head when we come from overseas, they make the assumption that the ministry is just a, a, a fancy ministry and people dress nice and go and work. But I can say to you that my staff, they are very, very hardworking and people and they will continue to work hard for the people of this country and for every dollar spent on my ministry, you get a hundred in return. France, Mr. Speaker, a deepening of bilateral relations with France and the French Department of Martinique was evident over the last year. In the crucial area of health, we continue to receive hospital-to-hospital -hospital support from one of the main hospitals in Martinique. And discussions continue with the aim of establishing a national MOU between the French and St. Lucia government. St. Lucia's Consulate General in Martinique in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in St. Lucia, continue to engage the Martinique and health authorities to find ways of simplifying the process for St. Lucian citizens requiring medical treatment in the French territory. And the prefet of Martinique has indicated his keen interest in finding solutions to improve it in the sector. From health to citizen security over the past seven months, the French government, through the police department in Martinique has partnered with St. Lucia in the critical area of crime and security. The countries have engaged in border patrol exchanges on a frequent basis, as well as sensitive crime investigations. Martinique has committed to providing training to our police officers and to our investigative and forensics department. The training as well as equipment donations to St. Lucia last fiscal year amongst well over 100,000 US dollars. In addition, a recent donation of equipment and other materials was made to the St. Lucia National Forensic Laboratory with an estimated cost of US $22 million. In addition, there is that exploration of closer trade between the French Antilles and, of course, St. Lucia. And we have decided to put a working group together so that we can explore those trading arrangements. So there is a broad platform for trade, economic cooperation, education, and cultural exchange resulting from those discussions, Mr. Speaker. Like I said, the agreement is to establish technical committees to further explore opportunities in those spectrum of things. <coughs> Venezuela, Mexico. 
As St. Lucia moves to improve South-South cooperation, Castries has restored and upgraded ties with Alba, TCP, Mexico, and Venezuela. Friendly, mutually respectful, and cordial relations were re-established between St. Lucia and, of course, Venezuela after the breakdown of previously productive and mutually respectful relations during 2016-2021. Accordingly, little time was wasted in the re-establishment of the Embassy of Venezuela in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, in New York, in the sphere of multilateral diplomacy and engagement, St. Lucia's ambassador to the United Nations the Honorable Menisa Rambali was elected chair of the UN Special Committee on Decolonization during elections held in February of this year. And whilst the youth are getting a bad rap, young St. Lucian Giovanni Henry was just last month appointed to the UN <coughs> Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. This is a group of seven young climate leaders who will primarily provide advice and practical recommendations towards accelerating the implementation of the Secretary General's Climate Action Strategy. The St. Lucian National is one of those seven young leaders appointed to this group for a two-year term. He is the first from the Caribbean region to serve on this board, which seeks to ensure that youth perspectives remain at the heart of climate action at all levels. Meanwhile, St. Lucia has launched a campaign for the presidency of the executive board of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. St. Lucia has a candidate on the board, but this time the election is to be president of the executive board. And that election will be held in November 2023. And St. Lucia, given its experience, and of course, where it is placed, I, I am very optimistic that we will win that particular election. Consistent with the foreign policy of this government, diplomatic forays were made into Africa with diplomatic relations in the past year of three African countries. Additionally, diplomatic relations were also established with Tuvalu and Bahrain. In the coming weeks, we shall take to cabinet a memo for the strategic engagement with the continent of Africa. And of course, Mr. Speaker, as soon as things get better, explore the possibility of physical presence on the continent as we try to reach new areas of cooperation that will benefit our country, create an improved framework for us to match our basic need with greater possibilities. The High Commission in the UK, as a result of a more active and progressive engagement by St. Lucia's mission in London, St. Lucia's High Commission is now a member of the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth Foundation. Through our mission in the UK, also St. Lucia was able to secure the attendance of the Director General of the World Trade Organization as our guest of honor to St. Lucia's 44th anniversary of independence celebration. Further, the High Commission has been engaging with universities and higher educational establishments to pursue opportunities for scholarships and for collaboration with St. Lucia. These engagements have led to the following. Birmingham University and Sir Arthur Lewis Community College are in communication with each other and are exploring opportunities for collaboration. Two, Waltham Forest College and Sir Arthur Lewis have been introduced to each other and have been facilitated similarly. They are due to sign a memorandum of understanding on the twinning of the two colleges shortly. The Jindal Global University of India has made a special award to St. Lucia of five tuition scholarships in diplomacy, law, business, and public policy. A memorandum of understanding has just been signed between the university and St. Lucia via the High Commission to cover a period of 10 years, Mr. Speaker.
In the area of international trade, Mr. Speaker, the government of St. Lucia is fully committed to the regional integration process and its obligations under the revised Treaty of Basté, establishing the OECS Economic Union and, of course, the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, establishing the Caribbean community, including the CARICOM single market and economy. We continue to make incremental strides in implementing the policy and legislative framework geared towards the broad objective of improving the standard of living of the people of this country and the growth and development prospects of our country and regions. With a robust and coordinated trade policy regime being an important mechanism to meet this obligation. So Mr. Speaker, again, when I speak about traveling to fulfill treaty obligations, you know, it's sometimes expedient for people to point the finger and say, oh, those people are just traveling. I never leave St. Lucia and just go to a country. It's because of treaty obligations. We go to CARICOM, we go to OECS, because it provides an improved framework. Again, like I've said, for us to match our basic need with greater possibilities. So, Mr. Speaker, I can go on and on speaking about the WTO in terms of the benefits to be derived by being in a rules-based organization, and it benefits us. Without the rules-based system, we are at a distinct disadvantage in navigating the turbulence of the contemporary global political environment. Mr. Speaker, I don't believe time and strict relevancy will permit me to go through all the areas. But of course, before I conclude that segment, I want to talk about the Civil Aviation Department and its contribution. It's well placed to make its contribution to trade and the economic development of the country. Most of the tourists that come and stay in this country, they come via air. And you know my ministry is a, a vital pillar in facilitating airlines come in here. We sign an air services agreement with Qatar, creating an improved framework. It may not happen this year or next year, but certainly creating the necessary mechanism, the necessary framework for us to attract people from non-traditional destinations, Mr. Speaker. We, we have seen some legislative review towards dealing with the shortcomings of ECA so that we go back to category one status, creating again an improved framework for us to address some of the challenges in our particular region. I want to end this segment on diaspora affairs, Mr. Speaker. My ministry has heightened efforts at ensuring that nationals in the diaspora are better informed on development initiatives and opportunities at home, ensuring likewise that the contributions, advice, and participation are sought in our decision making. Consequently, we expanded our distribution list from under 300 contacts to over 3,000 in the last fiscal year and significantly increase our presence on the various social media platforms, all in an effort to keep our nationals in the diaspora informed and hopefully engaged. Eight virtual public discussions or presentations were held with the support of our various missions to enlighten the diaspora on issues of citizenship, investment, passports, and customs. Three in-person diaspora meetings were held during which we directly interacted with over 300 nationals and live streamed to thousands more globally. This is in addition to over 50 meetings or discussions held with overseas-based nationals possessing an interest in investment or seeking guidance on matters of their own development or that of the country. In an effort to bridge the gap in the diaspora access to services of the state, no fewer than 10 government or quasi-government entities were engaged fundamentally in an effort to improve their services and access to the services by the diaspora and to promote the need for the greater engagement of our diaspora in their development activities. This included Customs and Excise, SSDF, Export St. Lucia, Invest St. Lucia, Ministry of Home Affairs, Citizenship, Department, Civil Status Registry, Immigration, Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and Ministry of Local Government. Harnessing the vast 
technical expertise that reside in the diaspora towards the advancement of St. Lucia's national development goals is a key priority for the ministry. In that regard, our outreach last year resulted in one of our nationals, Professor Dr. Keto Lawrenson, a renowned regenerative engineering scientist visiting St. Lucia and staging meaningful engagements with our premier educational institution, the Safa Lewis Community College, and facilitating the negotiation and signing of a cooperation memorandum of understanding between the Safa Lewis Community College and the University of Connecticut, where he is a professor. This partnership has resulted in the launch of the Yukon Jump St. Lucia, Just Us Moving program, a healthy living initiative at the Safa Lewis Community College. Additionally, discussions on the establishment of a regenerative engineering laboratory at the Safa Lewis Community College and the development of a hybrid regenerative engineering course between the two institutions are proceeding with lightning rapidity. Minimal faculty exchange visits have been conducted and the possibilities of more sustained faculty and student exchanges have been contemplated. In yet another strategic alliance, our Diaspora Affairs Office was able to secure European Union funding support through the International Center for Migrant Policy Department to conduct a skills profiling exercise of our nationals residing in the United Kingdom. The skills profile will provide us relevant data and information about our diaspora to facilitate better planning and decision making. The immense promise that lies in more optimal utilization of our diaspora was once again evident in the assistance received from the St. Lucia diaspora in the way of supplies for our hospital and relief for victims of last November's trough system, which adversely affected the north of St. Lucia. St. Lucia's consulate in Toronto mobilized and received donations from Charlotte Cleaning Products, a St. Lucian-owned business in Canada, of cleaning supplies valued at $143,174.58, or over $200. $290,000 EC for our hospitals. So $143,174.58 in Canadian dollars, but $290,000 EC for our hospitals. Through the efforts of our Council General in Toronto, there was also a shipment of a large quantity of relief items, including cleaning agents, clothing, food items, school supplies, and toiletries to the St. Lucia Social Development Fund for onward distribution to victims of the trough. Clearly, Mr. Speaker, the strategic priorities that frame St. Lucia's national development inform its external relations. And no doubt, Mr. Speaker, in keeping with the need to engage in some new avenues, for us to take this country to a new plane of development, there are structural changes we ought to make in this country. And so, last time when I had the opportunity to address this house, maybe in 2001, I spoke about the, the usefulness of an economist to really deal with economic policy. Because given the parameters of St. Lucia's international relations, has now shifted from the promotion of interest in an environment that is dominated by economic imperatives rather than ideological considerations. Macroeconomic policy is, the heart, is at the heart of foreign policy. Therefore, St. Lucia's foreign policy needs to be shaped by the very best economic analysis. Mr. Speaker, the use of empirical evidence and economic analysis are crucial in formulating and executing St. Lucia's foreign policy. It is therefore important to ensure that St. Lucia's foreign policy is underpinned by sound economic analysis. In this regard, the following is being done as we speak. A distillation of plans and proposals contained in the manifesto, because the manifesto 
captures the intent of the government, establishing some broad policy recommendations. We are going to distill it into a useful form, into specific policy recommendations that are anchored within the strategic development priorities of the country. Ensuring that those strategic priorities that frame St. Lucia's national development and informing external relations contribute even more to the macroeconomic and fiscal stability of our country and are in consonance with common objectives of humanity as outlined in the UN SDGs. Conducting analysis that support priority foreign policy areas in the coming period support the Ministry of External Affairs in the development of a strategic plan and analyzing the impact of developments in the global political and economic environment that impacts St. Lucia. In the coming period, we liaise with the Ministry of Economic Development in relation to the identification of projects that align with the priorities of the government and for which funding has not as yet been identified and which can be further developed for submission to diplomatic allies for funding considerations. In pursuance of St. Lucia's national interests and projects, provide policy advice on convergence between foreign policy and international cooperation including tackling global challenges within the framework of international cooperation. So we will be working with a range of stakeholders, including other government departments, consultancies, international organizations, partner governments in other countries, and academia in furthering and developing a global partnership for development. My ministry, Mr. Speaker, in particular, focus on measures to increase resources flow from both existing and non-traditional sources from governments and organizations. The economic advisor will be liaising with ministries in preparing proposals for funding consider considerations. I intend to see how best my ministry can support the development objectives of our government by way of increased mobilization of grant resources to assist our government in dealing with external shocks. Mr. Speaker, before I take my brief remarks on the budget or this appropriation bill to its logical conclusion, I want to address a matter which is of vital importance to our survival. And that is the clarification of the 2.5% health and security levy. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance stated that the priorities of the budget for 2023-2024 are health and national security. I wish to now comment on the challenges we face in each sector. In the health sector, the government has taken significant measures to address the infrastructural requirements of this sector through the construction of the Owen King EU Hospital, and our government is now taking decisive measures to complete once and for all the St. Jude's Hospital after the opposition frittered away over $140 million on an unfinished structure, the box, instead of completing the project which their government started after the fire destroyed the surgical ward and operating theater of the St. Jude's Hospital on September 9, 2009. Mr. Speaker, much has been said about the massive wastage of resources expended on the box. It is to be noted that while the government laid the infrastructural platform for the delivery of health services, the cost of health care remains outside of the reach of many St. Lucians, in particular the elderly, the unemployed, and the lower and middle income segment of, of the population. Our government started the process of developing a universal health care for the St. Lucian population as our government believes that health care should be a right and not a privilege. Mr. Speaker, when the government of the United Workers Party took office, they discarded all of the technical work that was carried out and decided to embark on what they call national health insurance. We have to date <coughs> see no evidence of any detailed work carried out by the former administration on this so-called national health insurance. Mr. Speaker, the issue of health care is an important one for many St. Lucians who cannot afford the cost. 
all of the studies show, Mr. Speaker, that there is a need for additional resources to finance the universal health care. And it is our firm belief and indeed our philosophy that health care should be a right enjoyed by all St. Lucians. We therefore need to be decisive, Mr. Speaker, and address the elephant in the room and provide a financing source for UHC. Similarly, Mr. Speaker, the Labour Party government has historically been responsible for making significant improvements to the infrastructure and national security for the construction and upgrading of police stations throughout the island. Sadly, many of these stations have not been maintained and are now, they are now not fit for occupation. The Prime Minister and Minister of Finance has announced that a contract has been signed for the renovation and repairs to the Viewford Police Station, and that construction will commence on the Gro has commenced on the Grosile Police Station. Moreover, the government has provided additional resources to the police, including notably vehicles. The government has also announced plans to commence construction of the Hall of Justice as a means to improve the justice system. Notwithstanding the foregoing initiatives, Mr. Speaker, there is need to invest additional resources in national security so that the government can make St. Lucia safer for its entire people. A fundamental role of government is to provide law and order, and it is a priority of the government to provide the police with the necessary resources to enable them to carry out the function more effectively and efficiently. I applaud the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance in taking the bold and decisive step in making more resources for health and security through the 2.5% health and security levy. Mr. Speaker, our government has implemented a series of measures designed to help the lower income and unemployed. These include providing significant re reprieve to parents through waiver of facilities fees and the payment of CXC mathematics and English and the provision of laptops. More recently, the government made fundamental reforms to the income tax regime, resulting in all people earning up to $25,000 per annum will pay no tax. In this current budget, the government has significantly increased allocation for public assistance to strengthen the social safety nets. Government also provided significant concessions in many areas, including the waiver of duties or taxes on construction materials, a rebate of $1 per gallon on fuel purchased by fishermen. The design of the 2.5% health and security levy has been carefully crafted so as to exclude food, selected building equipment, medication, security equipment, and medical equipment. The exclusion of these items from levy ensures that the impact on the citizens, notably lower income groups, are minimized. It is to be further noted, Mr. Speaker, that our government in implementing the VAT took significant measures to mitigate the VAT on the lower income group by zero rating a number of items. These include fresh milk, powdered milk, evaporated milk, eggs, rice, flour, sugar, uncooked pasta, preparations for infant use, agricultural inputs, water, electricity, animal feed, educational supplies, toilet paper, chicken cuts, potatoes, tomatoes, onions, garlic, broccoli, cabbages, carrots, peas, beans, celery, fruits, tuna, mackerel, just name it, Mr. Speaker. It is said that St. Lucia has the longest list of exempt goods under the VAT Act. This is by design, Mr. Speaker, as we ensure that we put in place measures to protect our citizens. Mr. Speaker, the budget of 2022-2023 provided a springboard upon which to launch the budget for 2023-2024. The budget for 2023-2024 is, de is designed to strengthen our economic and fiscal performance, increase investment, create more jobs, reduce unemployment, grow the private sector, improve the social services sector, including health, education, and expand the coverage of social safety nets as well as improve national security. Mr. Speaker, the opposition and the disciples are stunned 
by the economic and financial performance of the government in implementing its first budget. They can find no real fault with the budget and as a result have decided to engage in mischief and peddle on troops and propaganda in an attempt to mislead the citizens of St. Lucia as is the usual vibe. The campaign of misinformation has already begun on social media by attempting to portray the 2.5% health and security levy as burdensome tax and ignoring all of the comprehensive benefits contained in this budget for the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, they are putting all the skills they learned from Cambridge Analytica to full use and we must be guarded at all times to provide the St. Lucian public with truth, honesty, and accurate information at all times. I am on a long final at this juncture in time, Mr. Speaker. And so, as, as I slow down for landing, I want to commend again the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance for a job well done. Our optimism about the future is predicated upon the fact that the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance crafted a budget to achieve the following objectives. To place the economy on a path of fiscal correction to ensure the return of macroeconomic stability in the shortest possible time to provide support to the sectors of the economy that will provide the impetus to sustain economic growth and development, to provide maximum support to the poor, disadvantaged, and vulnerable in our society, to ensure that the resources of our country are spent efficiently and effectively so that the country and the people receive maximum value for the expenditures incurred. Mr. Speaker, this budget really gives expression to the meaning of our mantra of putting the people first and is a budget that is inclusive, equitable, and growth-oriented. These are consistent with the core values of the St. Lucia Labour Party. This budget marks a sharp departure from the budgets of the former government, which provided for a distorted form of development, resulting in widening income inequality and benefit, benefiting a select few that were coined the FFF. Under the leadership of the Honorable Prime Minister, St. Lucia will achieve the level of macroeconomic stability as well as the fiscal space needed to create opportunities for real and further increases in expenditure on social services, reduce the costs and risks for all investors, and therefore lay the foundation for increased investment and growth. Mr. Speaker, Singapore was able to make great strides over many, many years because one government with progressive policies implemented those policies. They got to maturity and gave birth to the type of results. And therefore, the performance I am seeing in this budget and in other areas by the Prime Minister demonstrates very clearly that this thing about Pani Dubuta Peya, one term, this one, that term, the another one, changing the change, that comes to an end now with the performance of the Minister for Finance and a cabinet that constitute a positive and a progressive crew that will fly through bad weather and effect a safe landing. We are on our way to the promised land, Mr. Speaker. Long live the member for Caswissis and long live the cabinet of the St. Lucia Labour Party.